I never wanted to work on climate change. In fact, when I first learned about climate change, it didn't even seem like something you could work on. For context, this was back in 2005, when I was in fourth grade. One day, climate change was brought up in my classroom. We were basically told that the world was ending and then sent off to recess. <laughs> and then it was never really brought back up. Over the next decade or so, I did my best to ignore the issue because what was I supposed to do about it anyway? But I found myself occasionally remembering that climate change was happening. And I'd feel this wave of existential dread or these pangs of guilt and anxiety. But I didn't do anything about it because climate change still felt like this far off problem for far off people. I alternated between feeling like the problem was too big to tackle and then like it wasn't actually relevant to my daily life. So then off I went to college and then grad school and then I eventually started a career in public health. I had a pretty clear vision of what I wanted to accomplish in public health and I never expected that it would lead me right back to climate change. I was actually working on public health projects right here in California and all the way in sub-Saharan Africa. And these projects all kept pointing to this relationship between climate change and public health. So, for example, when I was in Mali, working on regenerative agriculture and nutrition, the changing rainfall patterns there were undermining our work. Or when I was in Kenya, working on early childhood literacy, the extreme heat there was suffocating as students tried to learn. I realized that everywhere I went, climate change was impacting the very problems and solutions that I was working on in public health, which meant that to have the impact I wanted, I had to start working on climate change. And to be totally honest, this made me so mad. I didn't feel like climate change was supposed to be my fight. I'd chosen to work in public health, and I was resentful and frustrated because it didn't feel like I had much choice in the matter anymore. And then that frustration only grew as I learned about the extent of climate's impacts on our health. As a quick warning, the next minute or so is gonna be a little bit depressing because I'm gonna share some of those impacts. First and foremost, extreme heat is already leading to deaths, ER visits, and hospitalizations all over the world. In 2019, 345,000 people over 65 died due to extreme heat. This particularly affects the elderly, young kids, and people who work outside. In fact, we lost 295 billion potential hours of work to extreme heat exposure in 2020. For scale, that's 34 million human years. As weather patterns change, new and broader geographic regions are becoming ideal breeding grounds for mosquitoes. So the threat of infectious diseases like Zika, malaria, dengue, and chikungunya is on the rise, and these diseases are now spreading to places they've never been seen before. Across the continent, wildfires are wreaking havoc on our communities. Entire towns like Paradise, California, have been destroyed and their citizens displaced. The smoke from wildfires up in Canada is reaching as far as communities in Baltimore, Maryland, where it's leading to asthma attacks and ER visits. And I don't need to be the one to tell you that extreme weather events, like hurricanes, are getting worse and more frequent. We recently saw Hurricane Ian sweep through Florida and then move its way up the East Coast, where it led to over 100 deaths and $75 billion in damage. And finally, I want to touch on something that we're just now understanding. Climate change also impacts our mental health. We are seeing new phenomena like solastalgia, which is the distress caused by environmental change that impacts people in their home environment. We're also seeing rises in eco-anxiety, which is the chronic fear of environmental cataclysm and the resulting concern for your future or that of next generations. In fact, in a recent study from The Lancet, they found that 75% of youths feel that the future is frightening due to climate change. When I first learned that statistic and heard the term solastalgia and eco-anxiety, I realized that nine-year-old me wasn't alone. Climate change is scary, and for good reason. It's probably not surprising then, given those statistics, that I was really pessimistic about climate change. And 
what it meant for people. And this went on for a long time, years, actually. But that all changed when I started researching and working on solutions. In 2020, I started and ran the UCLA Center for Healthy Climate Solutions, where we studied how climate solutions could create benefits for people's health. And a few months ago, I took everything I learned there and started my own organization, Parachute.Earth. Parachute is centered around a research and storytelling project where we investigate and share how climate solutions can make our cities and our lives more beautiful and vibrant and resilient. I've spent the last few months traveling across the country, talking to people on the ground who are putting solutions to work in their communities. And it has given me so many reasons to be hopeful. Let me share some of what I've seen. Tree planting is probably the first thing that we think of when it comes to climate solutions. Trees are the original carbon capture technology, after all. And they also create a lot of adaptation benefits. They can reduce surface temperatures by up to 40 degrees. They can save cities millions of dollars in energy costs. And they even absorb stormwater to reduce the risk of flooding. And at Parachute, we're studying how to maximize their impact. So for example, we've seen groups like Green Minneapolis use innovative urban carbon credits to finance large-scale tree planting projects. And companies like Living Carbon are even genetically engineering trees to increase their carbon capture capacity. Another exciting solution is the invention of new types of building materials. One example is mass timber, which is an engineered wood product that's used in buildings. Though mass timber has been around for a while, exciting research is showing that it can actually be designed to act as an energy-free heat exchanger, which means that one day, our walls might act like air conditioners or heaters. We're also seeing new types of windows that use photovoltaic glass to generate electricity, and new types of paint that reflect heat right back into space. And going briefly back to Hurricane Ian, we saw the potential benefit of microgrids. A microgrid is a system that can help establish energy independence for a building, a neighborhood, or even a whole city through the use of independent energy generation, transmission, and then storage. Often, this means that a community will install solar, wind, or other sources of power. So if the grid goes down, their lights stay on. That's exactly what we saw in Babcock Ranch in Florida when Hurricane Ian hit. While surrounding counties were left without power, Babcock Ranch, which was designed for climate resilience, was largely undisturbed. With power and internet, they even acted as a shelter for neighboring towns. And finally, innovative social resources like resilience hubs are on the rise and being built all over America. I actually got to see the first of those developments in Tempe, Arizona, and right here in Los Angeles. A resilience hub is basically a building that has everything you need to stay safe during a climate emergency, from their own water and power to air filtration and cooling systems. But maybe more importantly, resilience hubs are designed to bring value and social connection to their communities every single day through things like after-school after programs, classes, clubs, and beautiful, accessible spaces. Some of these solutions might sound like they are out of a science fiction novel, but they're actually already being put to work in cities all over the world. And while they look different, I think we can all agree that they make our world more beautiful, and they also make our cities more resilient to the effects of climate change that are happening here and now. My goal now is to share these solutions as broadly as possible, because each one of us has a role to play in bringing them to every neighborhood and every block, whether that means advocating for a microgrid in your town, or inventing a new type of air conditioner, or investing in a cool new climate tech startup. Rather than focusing on everything that people tell you to give up because of climate change, I encourage you to instead think about everything that you can add to the world through deliberate climate action. Because everything that we build and bring to our communities enriches our lives and those of the people around us. This is what's converted me from climate pessimism to climate optimism. And it's why even though I used to resent it, I am now thrilled to work on climate change. And I hope that in whatever way makes sense for you, you'll use climate optimism to do the same. Thank you. Thank you.